Hello and welcome to my talk. My name is Eva Maria Müller and I'm currently a researcher at the University of Innsbruck's Department for American Studies and soon to be graduated from the University of Gießen where I will defend my PhD thesis Rewriting Alpine Orientalism Lessons from the Canadian Rockies and Austrian Alps in just a few weeks. I started my research on Alpine Orientalism when I was a fellow at the Worth Institute in 2012-2013. Today I'm going to present a part of the research that emerged from this day. Before I start, I'd like to thank the Worth Institute, in particular Sylvia Grobach, for the invitation to contribute to this virtual lecture series. The title of my talk today is Alpine Orientalism, a post-colonial reading of Austrian and Canadian mountain travel literature. Leaving through the boxes at the white archives of the Canadian Rockies in Banff, between a Baedeker guidebook and Arthur Conan Doyle's Memories and Adventures, I'm struck by a book cover. Black and white, with little of the by-me explicitness of some of the books on the Rocky Mountains sold on Banff Avenue, it would be inconspicuous to most. And yet, I'm captivated. Despite its overloaded and outdated design, the cover delights me. It shows endlessly still oceans, dangerous currents, sailing boats in rapid waves, shipwrecked sailors and coasts lined with palm trees. A crocodile, a seagull, a monkey, an elephant, a hippopotamus and a lion frame the bold letters that over the Rocky Mountains. The bold face conflict presented by the illustrations of Far Eastern and Africa, African fauna, on the cover of a book that claims to be about the Rockies, plainly revealed to me the necessity of analysing mountain travel through the conceptual framework of Orientalism. Orientalist discourse likely seems to many out of place in the Alpine world. But when lions and hippopotamuses roam the Rockies on book covers and ample reference to Orientalism is found in mountain travel writing, one has no other choice than to undertake a post-colonial reading. Like tourism itself, Orientalist discourse neither stops at mountain ranges nor freezes at cold temperatures, and scholarly analysis of mountain tra travel must at last account for its Oriental legacies and consider post-colonial theory an instrument in its analytical toolbox. Decorating a fictional travel account of a journey to the Rockies, with the imagery generally employed for oriental exploration, is more than a shrewd marketing gag by the 19th century London publishing house Nisbet & Co. Although the publisher used the imagery of orientalism to advertise their entire Valentine series, in which this title appears, such imagery creates a certain system of meaning surrounding mountains and supports it in gaining status of truth. In a longer version of this paper, I propose a concept catalogue of six key concepts effective in this apparatus of information gathering, of knowing the Alpine other. Today, however, I will focus only on the concept of the Orient. As we move along, I need to stress that Alpine Orientalism like its Saidian father, embraces several different kinds of othering. It shows itself in moments in which travel writers or publishers follow the Western tradition of using Oriental imagery, as well, as well as in instances in which writers resort to the familiar imagery of Orientalist discourse for the lack of more accurate ones. In this paper, I will take up Edward Said and Michel Foucault treating Alpine Orientalism sometimes as the general domain of various instances of othering, sometimes as individualizable and individual structures within discourse, and sometimes as regulated practice. To speak of Alpine Orientalism, therefore, is to speak about fractured, discontinuous, contradictory assumptions that participate in the othering of mountains 
in different combinations and the different times. I use this course to refer to the wider dynamic of Alpine Orientalism and concept to refer to the individual strains this Alpine Orientalism embraces. In other words, the study of Alpine Orientalism and the Alpine Orient brings together critical colonial discourse and concept-based research. As a work of theory, it takes from Zaid's Orientalism six chief First, its conviction that the systematic discipline of knowing the other is best studied through discourse analysis. Two, its reliance on literary production of space for a privileged group. Three, its modes of uttering along preconceived binaries. Four, its rootedness in romantic thought. Five, its acceptance of contradictions within discourse. And last but not least, it's trust that texts can create, quote, the very reality they appear to describe. As a work interested in the concepts within Alpine Orientalist discourse, this study takes from Mieke Baal's work on traveling concepts, a liberated engagement with critical terminology that abandons any obsession with proper usage of terms, equipping them with a readiness to travel between disciplines, historical periods and geographical locations. In keeping with Baal and Said, who argues elsewhere that the point of theory is to travel, I believe that we should not close our eyes to the insights orientalist concepts provide into the power structures of mountain tourism, even if they are inevitably altered by travel. As this paper inquires into the Orient as a powerful cultural category, it maps its conceptual relocation from hot, low altitude and extra-European regions to cold, high altitude and also intra-European places. It does so based on the wide reading of more than 80 sources of travel writing about the Canadian Rockies and Austrian Alps, published between 1828 and 1950, in the years leading up to the foundation of the Royal Geographical Society, in other words, institutionalized colonial expansion to the fall of the empire and its immediate aftermath. This wide range of material includes novels, exploration reports, newspaper articles, promotional documents, governmental records, mountaineering reports, guidebooks, travel diaries, letters and poems, all contributing to the cultural construction of the most popular alpine destinations in Canada and Austria. I turn first to literary constructions of the Canadian Rockies, mountains within the familiar realm of the British Empire, to establish the ground for a post-colonial reading of mountain literature before addressing the Austrian Alps, to tease out where, when and how intra-European and extra-European mountain travel is conceptualized along similar lines and differs in likeness. I begin where all studies on Orientalism begin, a misty imaginations of the Orient. Ashcroft, Griffith and Tiffin argued famously that European exploration to other parts of the globe began via land routes to the east. During a time in which the Canadian Rockies were an obstacle rather than a destination in their own right, the British Crown investigated the suitability of the colony of Canada for settlement and the possibility of constructing a railway line that would connect Canada, quote, to British possessions in the Orient. The position of the Canadian railway lines in connecting East and West, nation building and mountain tourism 
is a research project unto itself. But a CPR map published in Arthur P. Coleman's The Canadian Rockies reveals with astonishing clarity how the world-famous tourist train placed the Rockies straight onto the tracks leading to the Orient. The way by which mountains became a commodity was thus paved. The CPR saw Canadian land as a chain of opportunities for enrichment. From the commercial centre, by the sportsman region and mineral belt, to the granary of the world, the National Railway Line linked Great Britain and Europe to the Orient, and the Rockies were the last stop before this British treasure trove. Apart from a geographic orientation fostered by trade, the Alpine Orient is an aesthetic project and a colourful European invention in the Saidian sense. This means that the literatures creating meaning systems about mountains in the 19th and 20th centuries emphasise some of the exotic sublimity of late 18th century paintings, most often through reference to oriental colours. In the Rockies of Canada, Walter Wilcox, for instance, draws a direct comparison to the colours of the Orient during his explorations in Consolation Valley. Then, as summer advances, there appears the characteristic flower of the Rockies, the painted cup. It is like a tuft of leaves dipped in the richest dyes of the Orient. In this quote, the legacy of the picturesque merges with that of the Orient when the plant, also known as Indian paintbrush, is dipped into the very colours that soothe the eye of Western travellers. Mabel B. Williams alludes to a painting of the Orient in the 1928 brochure of Jasper Park as she describes Pyramid Mountain. The sombre oriental richness of its colouring gives it special distinction. Deep purples, gorgeous Persian reds and mulberry are splashed across the rocks like pigment dawed on by a titan's brush. When Mabel B. Williams refers to oriental richness or the even more distinctive Persian reds, she treats the Rockies like a canvas that is painted by the Western imagination using an oriental colour palette. Similar descriptions of Pyramid Lake can be found in a CNR The unusual colouring of the strata dark, slag-like rock, splashed and banded with old red, maroon and tawny yellow, gives the peak something of the richness of an oriental tapestry. And when, towards evening, the purple shadow is gathered about its base, and the whole is reflected in the peacock waters of Pyramid Lake at its feet, the scene is beautiful beyond description. In the romantic visual tradition of framing landscapes, this representation of pyramid mountain and lake turns their grandeur into an artefact. In such moments, Alpine, Oriental Alpine Orientalism aesthetically exploits mountains as places full of imaginative possibility and renders mountain travel literature a representation of canonical material guided by an aesthetic and executive will capable of producing interest in the reader. Furthermore, the above description additionally shows how Alpine Orientalism can affect an understanding of Alpine fauna. Instead of mentioning caribou or mountain goats, which one is more likely to encounter during a visit to the Canadian Rockies, the brochure, the brochure alludes to the peacock, an animal indigenous to India 
that frequently appears when travellers' imaginations go wild. In a reference to Lake Louise, J. Monroe Thorington advises his readers quote, to stop and look back at a peacock blue corner of the lake, and remarks elsewhere that quote, one sees the peacock blue water of Hector Lake. It seems as if these writers apply what they know about uttering the Orient to the new places they encounter in the Rockies. Regardless of whether the traveller visits Lake Louise, Hector Lake or Pyramid Lake, surrounded by their respective glaciers, the landscape is characterised by a peacock blues and oriental reds and golds. As understood through Orientalism, the Rockies are not just fragments of a text, but as Said had it, something to be encountered and dealt with to a certain extent because the texts made that Orient possible. Such an Orient was silent, available to Europe for the realization of projects that involved but were never directly responsible to the native inhabitants. A prominent example of one of these projects is Van Su, which introduced two ring-tailed monkeys as well as one pair of peacocks in 1913. A report by the Department of Interior also reveals that local moose were exchanged for a polar bear and the only native animal held was a black bear cub caught at Lagan, and an earlier name for the town of Banff. One could almost say that the Rockies were turned into an attractive tourist destination by expelling the original alpine inhabitants and introducing the much trendier cast of oriental discourse. Additionally, like Said's Orientalism, the Alpine Orient is possessed by the architecture of Egypt and the East, in instances in which travel writing contains descriptions of mountains as minarets, mosques and pyramids. In a 1927 travel brochure, the CNR describes the glittering spires and towers of Mount Columbia, Mount Alberta and Mount Douglas as standing in the landscape like the minarets of an eastern mosque while travel reports and novels relate mountains to pyramids. Hezekiah Butterworth's protagonist, for instance, recounts a walk in the Cascade Mountains among pyramids older than the pyramids. Wilcox, meanwhile, contends that compared with these columns, the pyramids of Egypt, the palaces of Yucatan and the temples of India are young, even in their antiquity. It is particularly noteworthy that both of these references not only reveal the common practice of framing Canadian mountains through Eastern architecture, but also demonstrate how these passages foreground the timelessness attributed to the Rockies of Canada. In a mode of romantic uttering, the Canadian Rockies were temporarily distanced from, distanced from Europe and ascending them meant, in a way, also travelling back in time. Turning now to Europe, in bearing in mind that according to Zaid, quote, in Europe itself, at the end of the 19th century, scarcely a corner of life was untouched by the facts of empire, it is not surprising to find Orientalist references also in Alpine travel literature. Adolf von Schaden, a successful German, German travel writer, states that only the view that is spread out like a colourful carpet, could compensate for the hard climb up the Venediga. Heinrich Heine engages in the boldest and most insightful Alpine Orientalism in his Reisebilder from 1865, when he finds the Alpine crowns of Tyrol in clouds, as if wrapped with grey turbans. He evokes an image of mountains 
this figure is stunning headgear typical of those living in the near, middle and far east. The parallel drawn between cloud and turban casts the mountain as a human person. This is a personification that is nowhere to be found in Western travel literature on the Rockies. This is no coincidence. Those travelling to the Alps were acutely aware that local people inhabited this area. And yet the presence of indigenous peoples in the Rockies was never acknowledged or respected in that same manner. Oriental references used to culturally produce the Austrian Alps noticeably reflect the human presence and did so even in the imperial act of naming. During the first ascent of the Groß Venediga, for instance, a section of the prominent glacier in present-day Hohe Tauern Park was named Türkische Zell. Turkish Tent City With remarkable consistency, Oriental vocabulary was hurled at the mountains within Europe and beyond while a human presence was acknowledged only in the Alps. It is unsurprising then that the people brought to the Rockies to support the growing tourist industry after indigenous and Métis locals had been expelled were quickly given oriental touches, as if the Orient were a label guaranteeing promotional success. A guide is depicted wearing his red bandana turban, the packer placed a part of a dragoman in the east, and CPR staff speaks in a soft oriental voice. Alpine orientalism, especially in the commercial enterprise of mountain tourism, hovers in the thin air of alpine heights, like burning incense. In a time in which Canada Parks advertises its cave and basin national historic sites as some fantastic dream from a tale of the Arabian Nights and in a time in which hundreds of magic carpets take young skiers up the mountains and instill into them the feeling The claim that Alpine Orientalism is not just a historical phenomenon, but a contemporary problem and a material reality is more appropriate than ever. It is also more relevant. When a post-colonial reading of mountain travel literature exposes the global force of Alpine Orientalism, post-colonial action then involves that we as mountain people, must continuously speak truth to that very power. Thank you.